The Polykarpov I-185 is one of the foremost of the what-if aircraft. Fast, agile and heavily armed, the I-185 easily had the potential to be the best fighter in the world when it first flew in early 1941. The ultimate evolution of the Polykarpov fighter line that had started with the I-1 in 1923. Indeed, it could have, arguably should have, been an aircraft that today is held up as one of the greatest ever. In testing, it recorded a top speed of 426 miles per hour, and even when burdened with three 20mm cannon for combat trials by Soviet pilots in late 1942, early 43, they reported that the I-185 was superior to anything else they had flown, both domestic and foreign designs, and was much superior to the German aircraft it had faced. Indeed, the recommendation was that the I-185 be put into production immediately. However, that never happened, and the general explanation for this is that the I-185 was cursed with essentially prototype engines that largely failed, or else were needed for other aircraft that could be got into production more easily and quickly. But that is far from the complete answer, and the reality is that the story of the I-185 is also one of brutal power plays, personal enmities, and Machiavellian political manoeuvring that make Game of Thrones look like Sesame Street. It is also a story of how precarious things could be in the Soviet Union under Stalin. And as such, it is a story about men. Principally, this one. Nikolai Nikolaevich Polikarpov. I would say that Polikarpov is heavily underrated nowadays, largely because it isn't well remembered just what he achieved. But because of Polikarpov, the Soviet Union went from basically using foreign fighters from the mid-1920s to building arguably the best in the world by the mid-30s. Indeed, throughout most of that decade, Polikarpov's fighters were the only ones used by the Soviet Air Force. And when the many different nations' fighters got the chance to engage one another and allow for comparison during the Spanish Civil War, Polikarpov's I-15 biplane and I-16 monoplane, which was nicknamed Rata by its nationalist enemies, proved at least as good, and often far better, than rivals. No wonder then that Polikarpov was known as the king of the fighters. But the thing about being king is that there is always someone looking to replace you in the position. And this wasn't helped by the fact that Polikarpov walked a very fine line sometimes. In one tale, it is said that while riding in a car with Stalin, the dictator told Polikarpov that the difference between him and the fighter designer was that though they had both been educated at seminary, Polikarpov had graduated while Stalin had not. To which Polikarpov replied, This is evident. Is that balls of concrete or what? I mean, it's one thing to sit in a cage with a tiger. It's another thing to spit in its eye. Polikarpov also didn't conform to the expected Soviet norms in other ways. He never joined the Communist Party, and continued to both attend church and openly wear a crucifix. Religion was practically anathema to the Soviet Communist Party, and Polikarpov's actions certainly put him in the proverbial crosshairs, which were only diverted by the fact he was so important to the party's military plans. But that didn't protect him in the long run. Following the success of the I-16, Polikarpov and his bureau set about developing a successor, the I-180. This took the I-16 and raised it to the next level, adding a full closing canopy and seeking to employ new and more powerful engines then under development. Unfortunately, the aircraft marked the start of the end of Polikarpov's influence. Despite the designer insisting that more work needed to be done to correct issues with the aircraft, in December 1938, famed test pilot Valery Chakalov took the prototype up for the first time. What followed was never really resolved satisfactorily, but what is clear is that Chakalov took the aircraft without any of the senior factory staff giving authorization that he could do so, and then he proceeded to take the aircraft way beyond what had been considered safe for the first test flight. Somewhat unsurprisingly, he was killed when the I-180 smashed into buildings when he was attempted to return to the airstrip. This was a disaster, 
because Chakalov was a literal national hero in the Soviet Union. Think of him as the Gagarin of his day. I mean, his ashes are buried at the Kremlin and they made a movie about him. And so the NKVD, Stalin's terrifying secret police, responded just as you would expect and arrested a whole bunch of folks at the Polikarpov Bureau, accusing them of sabotage. Polikarpov seems to have avoided this unwanted attention, but when the second I-180 prototype was lost in an accident in September 1939 and another test pilot killed, well, it seems that Stalin's largesse started to come to an end. So Polikarpov was probably quite glad when he got sent to Nazi Germany in October as part of a technical exchange following Germany and the Soviet Union signing the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. The idea was that as the leading Soviet fighter designer, he was the perfect candidate to look over German developments in this field to see what they were about and how capable their newest designs looked to be. But while the cat's away, the mice will play, as the old saying goes. And in December, while Polikarpov was still in Germany, two of his senior employees approached the authorities in Moscow with a proposal for a new fighter design that was in development at the Polikarpov Bureau, the I-200. Permission was swiftly given not just to build the new aircraft, but also that a whole new bureau be set up for the job, named after the two men who had taken the initiative, Artem Mikoyan and Mikhail Gurevich. The I-200, an aircraft that Polikarpov had been working on before it was basically pinched from him, became the MiG-1. And not just content with stealing his design, the new MiG Bureau also got Polikarpov's principal construction facilities and half the staff, taking the very cream of the design team and workforce. Polikarpov therefore returned from his mission to Germany to find much of his life's work stolen and the only real prospect for him being the I-180, an aircraft that was proven to be a dangerous liability. But to give Polikarpov his due, he wasn't going to take it lying down. Assigned new facilities that were basically an empty hangar, in early 1940, Polikarpov set about not only re-establishing his bureau, he started design work on a new fighter, the I-185. This was essentially the pinnacle of his design career the finest aircraft he ever built, and apparently benefited, ironically, from his trip to Germany. Because while other Soviet designers were building their aircraft to the standard of Germany's latest fighter, the BF-109E, Polikarpov understood that this aircraft was developing at a rapid pace, and so set about to overmatch not just the current standard, but future potential opposition too. The I-185 was built with a plywood monocoque fuselage combined with an all-metal and extremely thin wing. Careful design of this and the flaps meant that the I-185 enjoyed a far better reputation for handling than its I-16 predecessor. That aircraft, though a formidable fighter, had some vicious tendencies and killed a fair number of its pilots. The I-185, according to the reports that came later in its development program, seems to have been a real cherry, with both docile handling for inexperienced pilots, but also capable of superb agility in combat. And perhaps most remarkably, considering the dire straits that he found himself and his company in, Polikarpov managed to get the first I-185 prototype built by May 1940. Yes, just months after having his bureau gutted and being kicked out of his factory, Polikarpov produced a design that had the potential to be the best fighter in the world. See what I mean about that whole king of the fighters business? I should also point out that this wasn't some test bed. The aircraft was armed with two 12.7mm and two 7.62mm machine guns and had protected fuel tanks. The problem was, as is generally recited in the history of the aircraft, with the engines. Note the plural. And this issue is still a matter of some debate, with some blaming Polikarpov for not giving enough consideration to other engines as a potential power plant in the first place. However, considering the scheming that was occurring against Polikarpov, with it being a held opinion in the Soviet aviation industry at the time that his days were literally numbered and a firing squad was going to be happening in his very near future, it is possible that the reason he chose the initial engines for the I-185 that he did was that he simply wasn't given any other choice. At first, Polikarpov intended to fit the new aircraft with the Tomansky M90 radial, 
this was a new engine still in development, but with its promise of 2000 horsepower, it was hoped to have a great future. Unfortunately, that wasn't to be, and when the first M90 arrived at Polykarpov, it was found to woefully underdeliver on its power, with it being calculated that the engine, if fitted, wouldn't even get the aircraft airborne. The prototype was swiftly reworked to use another developmental engine, the M81. With this, the aircraft finally managed to fly for the first time on the 11th of January 1941. But again, this engine was a failure and swiftly abandoned. But Polykarpov was not waiting around for failure and had already begun building two other prototypes, one to take the Shvetsov M71 radial and the other the same company's M82A. These two prototypes also boosted the firepower to three 20mm cannon. Things suffered a severe delay when Germany invaded the Soviet Union in June 1941, and the entire Polykarpov works had to be shifted east out of the conflict zone. But by this point, three I-185s were flying. The original prototype had now been equipped with an M-71 engine, as had the third aircraft built, and this engine seemed to hold hopes because it was expected to once again provide 2,000 horsepower. Unfortunately, like the previous M90, the M71 had quite a few issues, but it did work well enough to give the I-185 a very respectable performance and a sighted top speed of around 390 miles per hour. The second aircraft built was fitted with an M82A radial engine. The M82 is often overlooked, but should be ranked with the other great Allied aircraft engines such as the Double Wasp or Rolls-Royce Merlin. Some 70,000 were built, and though it only produced 1,700 horsepower, it was a light and slim engine and would provide the power plant for such formidable aircraft as the Lavoshkin LA-5 through 11 fighters and the Yakovlev Yak-3U. Of note in the development of these aircraft is the fact that both of these bureaus were provided with Polykarpov's installation drawings for the engine in the I-185, which they used for their own designs. But to return to the I-185, regardless of all the problems that had been encountered, including that whole world war thing, by February 1942, the I-185 were ready to undergo testing and assessment. In March, the Soviet Air Force Research Institute issued their report on the I-185, which concluded that the I-185 M-71 aircraft in its flight characteristics stands above all existing domestic production and foreign aircraft. In handling in the air and on the ground, the aircraft is simple and easy for pilots of medium and lower than average qualification. The I-185 M71 aircraft, armed with three Shvac 20mm cannons, meets modern front requirements and is recommended for adoption by the Air Force of the Red Army. The I-185 M82A yields only to the I-185 M71, surpassing all other types, both ours and foreign. Handling is similar to the I-185 M71, i.e. simple and accessible to pilots of below average qualification. Immediately following the conclusions of the Air Force Institute tests, the I-185s were issued to a frontline squadron, the 728th, for combat evaluation. These had limitations placed upon them, such as being forbidden from flying over enemy territory to prevent the aircraft falling into enemy hands, but once again, the I-185 received tremendous praise, and the pilots stated that all variants outperformed all enemy fighter types they encountered while still being easy to fly. Again, the assessment was that, as far as the pilots were concerned, the I-185 was the best fighter flying. But despite this, no production of the aircraft was ordered. So what happened? Again, the general histories of the aircraft mentioned the fact that ultimately the M-71 engine was to be cancelled, which excluded production of the most formidable version of the I-185 from ever happening. But also, by this point, development of the Lavoshkin LA-5 was rapidly occurring. This aircraft used the M-82 and was essentially a conversion of the Lag-3 fighter, which was already in full production and would require far less effort to get into service. Those are all very valid points, plus consideration must be given to the fact that the I-185's wing was a complex structure that used scarce alloys in its production, while the Lavoshkin designs did not. These are all sensible reasons for the LA series to be built and the I-185s to not, 
a case of perfection losing to good enough. But it isn't quite the whole story. The glowing praise from the pilots at the front inspired Polykarpov, and he recognised that it was his duty to report that the new aircraft could be a huge asset to the Soviet Air Force if only production would be authorised. So he wrote to Stalin in early 1943, telling him of the I-185's excellent performance figures. Unfortunately, Stalin's opinion of Polykarpov was dropping lower and lower, and so in February 1943, he called a meeting to discuss the claims about the new aircraft. Notably absent from this meeting was Polykarpov himself, or anyone who had flown the aircraft. So Stalin asked his Vice Minister for Aviation whether the excellent figures Polykarpov reported for the I-185 were real or not. The Vice Minister was Alexander Yakovlev. Now, I'm sure that's a name that's familiar with pretty much anyone watching this video, but for those who might not know, Yakovlev was, in addition to holding his government position, also an important aircraft designer in his own right, and had his own aircraft bureau. So, I think we can conclude that Yakovlev could be considered a party with a vested interest in this matter, considering that his bureau was competing for orders and materiel directly with Polikarpov which would explain what he said, because he told Stalin that no, these are not real figures, they are projected ones as the I-185 had not undergone proper state testing. This is in his memoir, by the way. Stalin said he didn't believe any of it, and come back to him when they had some solid data. The thing was, the figures given by Polykarpov might not have been from official state testing, but they were given to him by the pilots of the Air Force Research Institute, who had flown the I-185. Also noticeable, no mention of the praise from the combat pilots. Whether Yakovlev was being deliberately deceitful, well, I'll leave you to decide for yourself. He was, at best, woefully ignorant and incompetent at his job. At worst, he deliberately sabotaged Polykarpov. Given all that had happened in the previous few years, personally, I strongly suspect the latter. Because, after all, the Yakovlev Bureau would produce one of the Soviet's most prolific fighter series of the entire war, the Yaks, something that production of the I-185 would probably have impeded if it had proved to have as much promise as it seems to have had. But that was not to be, and the I-185 was cancelled after the first prototype also crashed in April 1943, killing yet another unfortunate pilot. Now, it might seem that that's a lot of crashes, but to be honest, aircraft of that era crashed because of structural and engine failures fairly routinely, and considering the amount of use and testing the three prototypes had gone through, it probably isn't too surprising. Regardless, Polykarpov was shortly after appointed to a position at the Moscow Aviation Institute, which in Stalin's mercurial way was him signalling the end of Polykarpov's career as a designer, but that he still enjoyed a measure of his protection. The King of the Fighters didn't last much longer anyway, dying just over a year later from stomach cancer. And that is the story of both a remarkable aircraft designer and a remarkable aircraft. Because although the information on the I-185 is somewhat limited, it really does seem to have been a front rank contender for the title of Best Aircraft Never Adopted. Because unlike others, it did see service, including combat, and apparently it absolutely excelled. And here is another factor to bear in mind. The first I-185 was ready in May 1940. The M82 engine, with which that later test model proved so formidable with, went into production in late 1940. Had Polykarpov had access to that engine for his first design, as well as perhaps not having practically his entire bureau whisked away from underneath him, the Soviets could have been in a position, if they had really wanted to, to get the I-185 into service in short order. While I suspect this wouldn't have made a huge difference with the initial invasion of the Soviet Union by Germany, as many of the available Soviet aircraft were destroyed on the ground, and numbers of the I-185 would have been limited even if it had got into production by that point, the Soviets would still have had the potential to field a fighter not long after the beginning of hostilities that was, reportedly, markedly superior to anything the Germans had in the air in 1943, let alone mid-1941. 
The shock that the T-34 and KV-1 tanks gave the Wehrmacht is well known and documented. Such a shock could easily have been inflicted on the Luftwaffe as well. But that was not to be. Thwarted, in my opinion, by personal ambition and vindictiveness. Tragic, but there you are. Oh, and while we're on the topic, let me throw in a final thought on possibilities. When Polykarpov began his career as an aircraft designer in 1916, he first worked for one Igor Sokolsky. You might be familiar with that name. After the Russian Revolution and the onset of the Civil War in that country, Sikorsky decided to flee to the United States, where he established a company that is still today a world leader in rotor aviation. But Sikorsky also reputedly asked one of his most talented designers, Polykarpov, if he would like to come with him. Polykarpov obviously declined, but it is interesting to think what may have been had the King of the Fighters made his career in the United States instead of the Soviet Union.